Two Romantic Poems and a Friendship Tower from Jesus Hello, my name is Wayne O'Connor. Even though I am a romantic at heart, my life has not allowed that side of my personality to shine. Briefly over the decades, it has peeked out warily from the shadows that protect it from the dangers of the world. From time to time as well, it is the muse which inspires my writing. Today I would like to share two poems that I have included in the story Half Jack and Leprechaun, which are found in my book Waysides Along the Journey, Spiritual Wisdom and Adventures in Literature. Material below also includes information from my two books, The Baby Echolalia of Christendom and Visitation. All of my books are available at Amazon.com. First, a bit of backstory, greatly abridged, which may explain for the curious why the romantic side of my nature has remained so deeply concealed. I realize that it makes my writing awkward, but to protect the innocent and not-so-innocent, I will not be using names. Unfortunately, most of you will not believe me. Most of my friends and family during my life didn't believe me either, until the time came when they would see evidence. And then, as often as not, they would attempt to rationalize it all away. I have lost count of the number of times that Christians have said to me, God doesn't work that way, or, yes, I see it, but that doesn't change anything. God cannot do that. Or, God's never done that in my life, or with anyone I've known. Why would he do that in your life? Of course, some do not like the idea of courtship or betrothal at all. Others in the more patriarchal families have opined that God would never have said what I have written in the next paragraph because it disagrees with their betrothal rules. When I was four or five, I had a series of visions and dreams which I didn't understand, but as they would return every few years or so until my 21st year, they began to have more clarity as I aged. After that, the dreams would reoccur individually, but not in a series. In one of those dreams, the Lord said that I was reserved for his use and that I would not date or date very little. He said that you cannot ask a woman to marry you. You cannot ask a father for his daughter's hand. I will arrange the marriage. When I went to college, I resisted the Lord concerning his plans. I wish that resistance would have ended with graduation from college. It did not. But I must add that my post-college resistance was not as willful, and quite often I was trying to do right, but I just misread things. Let me also add that even though I didn't like it at the time, I'm very thankful now, but uh, it's just unbelievable the way the Lord uh, kept me from having dates or relationships uh, with girls uh, while I was in college. I, I did know some girls, but it was always like through their boyfriends or uh, activities that I would uh, do for the dorms or something like that. Uh, like I said, the Lord, uh, if he puts his mind to something, he's absolutely amazing. It wasn't uh, gentleman quarterly material, but uh, I lost weight. I got pumped up at the gym. I even got to be somewhat famous in the dorms. I was uh, the grand spelunk. I remember uh, uh, you could go to uh, the bars, and uh, you know I had friends tell me this. It even happened to me once, uh, where someone would come and they'd ask you like your sign or what your major was, and uh, they would ask, uh, "Do you know the grand spelunk?" Well, that was me. Back to the story. One day, alone in my dorm room, I cried out to God in frustration, tears running down my cheeks. Fog filled the room, and I heard his voice. You are reserved. Go to Genesis chapter 24. Moments later, the fog cleared. I grabbed my Bible and located Genesis 24, which is the story of Eliezer finding Rebecca for Abraham's son, Isaac. Until my last semester of college in 1985, I tried not to test the Lord again on the issue. Just after my senior finals, I heard about a Christian girl who had recently broken up with her boyfriend. I had heard a rumor about what she would do, and she did just that. She went, after finals, to Water Street, which is not far from UX campus, to find a guy, any guy. I went looking for her, and I found her at Stable Saloon, sitting alone at a table in back. She talked with me a few minutes, and then offered to take me to her apartment. Suddenly, Jesus appeared to me, like a three-dimensional glowing statue, and said, Are you sure you want to do this? I was filled with shame, but also the courage to do what was right. I thanked her for her offer, but took her instead to meet her sister, who was also searching Water Street, trying to find her. 
Not long after college, I was meeting with a home fellowship group that was being held by a husband and wife who had been at the traditional church I was attending. While I was praying, and I was complaining actually because God never spoke to me like he did to some of the others in the group, I heard the Lord speak to me. He had said, I am going to put you through a test that I put very few of my servants through, an Ezekiel Moriah test. Later I asked one of my mentors what that had meant. He responded, I have never heard of an Ezekiel Moriah test. He then added, I have heard of an Ezekiel test. That's where the Lord gives you a hard word and you have the choice of being obedient or refusing to give the word. I have also heard of a Moriah test. That's where you have to prove your service to the Lord by giving up something of great value in order to obey him. I am not going to go into detail, but shortly after that, a lady from that fellowship befriended me. She offered me a relationship, which was to start the next time we met. When I saw her the next time, the Lord appeared before me again, but he was so bright that I couldn't look at him. Thus began the great Ezekiel Moriah test. For years I thought that was the test. What I experienced was really an initial pop quiz in a lifelong class filled with lectures, labs, and exams. Jesus asked me three times if I would give her the word he had for her. I denied him the first time. The second time I asked if I could hear the word and then give it to her in a diplomatic way. When he asked me for the third time, I surrendered. I don't even know what I said to her. She called the host of our fellowship and said that she would no longer be coming. She had added that she wanted nothing to do with me. I called her. She confirmed what I had been told. The strange thing was that as she prepared to hang up, I had a short vision. In that vision, the Lord promised that he would give me a friendship tower, a revelation that was without solace at the time. Actually, I saw myself walking around inside the tower, which was a museum. While I eagerly explored the museum, I was also searching for a wife. From time to time, ladies would appear in that museum. They could exit the tower museum any time they wanted. I could not. The only way I could exit the tower museum is if one of them married me. Now, that's not quite accurate. Uh, there was one that could not exit the tower either, but she kept running away and hiding. Anyway... I learned a valuable lesson from my experience with the lady who was used for the Ezekiel portion of my Ezekiel Moriah test. That was the only time the Lord ever asked me to give a word to a Friendship Tower girl. Too bad I had to wait three years to learn my lesson not to chase after Friendship Tower girls. About a year and a half following that test, I was audacious enough to tell the Lord in tears that I couldn't stand it any longer, and unless he reconciled us, I was going to throw in the towel. That evening, she appeared at the church I was attending. After a moment of shock, she sat with me. Following the service, she said that we could be friends again and asked me to visit her the next day. When I went to visit her, she said that she had changed her mind. I kept chasing after her by writing letters, and about a year later, even had an old Pentecostal lady pray her in for me. The young woman, four years older than me actually, spent a month or so driving by Hardy's, where I was uh, working as an indoor-outdoor maintenance person. Following the pray-in, she just happened to stop at the restaurant. I think I talked with her the first time, and she said that she'd stop by again to chat with me. When she came, a supervisor who liked to make my life miserable detained me. When I got back, the lady was gone. I wrote a letter explaining the situation. After that, she started coming to the restaurant two or three times per week. She would refuse to speak with me, then glare at me if I was inside, or roll down her window and yell at me if I was outside. Sometimes she would come with a miscellaneous guy, have coffee, then exaggeratedly flirt with him. She did that two or three times per week for a month or so, mostly angry flybys. The guy thing didn't happen too often. Jesus finally intervened and arranged an emergency family issue, which caused her to move out west. I then realized something that should have been evident long before. She could never have fit the Lord's qualifications, nor was she the only lady who would enter the Friendship Tower. During the early spring of 1989, I had a vision of the Lord which is detailed in my book, Visitation. What made this challenging is that for much of the information I had been given, topical headings, so to speak, about the material, and then promised that events would later occur, and then I would just instantly know the larger amount of data that went along with the heading. 
For example, the Lord mentioned the phrase friendship tower, and I knew that there were several rules that went with it, but I didn't know those rules. Not long after my test, I had a vision of myself in the tower. That's the one where I said it was like a museum. It wasn't until I had been told that I was going to be invited into the betrothal phase of the Friendship Tower years later that I instantly had a burst transmission, several pages worth, which outlined in detail the betrothal as well as Friendship Tower rules. I quickly wrote them down and still have them. Jesus reminded me during the three-dimensional vision of his promise from when I was younger that you cannot ask a woman to marry you. You cannot ask a father for his daughter's hand. I will arrange the marriage. He went on to say that he would be like a father in a real earthly betrothal. Jesus reminded me that he did not want me to date. The Lord talked to me about a friendship tower. I am not going to go into detail, suffice it to say. He explained the short tether he had placed on me concerning ladies. Later I resisted the tether and learned more valuable lessons. One of the biggest lessons was not to keep pushing for someone the Lord hadn't chosen. The second lesson took a few years, but I finally learned that if the girl or her family said no, let it go. The one exception to this lesson was the betrothal. Until it was officially ended, I had to honor it. A few people who would see where it was going thought I was not letting go, but I would have had to dishonor the Lord if I would have broken the betrothal. By the time the post-betrothal courtship phase began, I was free to let the Friendship Tower girls leave the tower and not chase after them. Not only free, but able. Technically, I did not chase after the betrothal girl, but I did wait a long time for her until the betrothal was officially ended. Back to the 1989 three-dimensional vision. During the vision, the Lord had also said that the betrothal Friendship Tower lesson would reflect how many within Christendom dishonor him or are bonded to a person or denomination rather than Jesus Christ. He also added that he would use this issue over time to teach me discipline, obedience, and unconditional love. So how was the courtship or Friendship Tower friendship supposed to work? Basically, the Lord would talk to the girl and her, her family in some fashion, and after that I had to wait to be invited into her life. Once I was invited in, the girl could just be friends with me or start a courtship. For either friendships or courtships, I was to exhibit unconditional love, but there was no need to go the extra mile to wait for them. However, I never actually entered a courtship. I was friends with one such girl for several years. I wasn't allowed by her choice to call her, but we did trade letters, emails, and occasionally gifts. She had wanted a husband badly, but had a list of requirements which I did not meet. She was, however, a loyal friend for many, many years and only stopped communicating this summer. There was another Friendship Tower girl who was a friend for possibly a dozen years. We traded emails or Facebook messages, called occasionally, and visited each other from time to time. The visits were always within a family context rather than a dating situation. That one had also decided that she only wanted to be friends with me but not enter a courtship. However, years later, when she decided that she did want to enter a courtship, her father had changed his mind. As I was earning about $20,000 less than when I had originally been invited into a courtship. After that, she stopped communicating with me. Strangely, both friendship girls in this paragraph exited the tower about the same time, the summer of 2012. Suffice it to say, over the years, I have been invited into several courtship consultations. There were also times where I found out later that the Lord had kept his word and talked to ladies or families on my behalf. Once, very early on, I didn't even know the girl or family who the Lord had talked to about me. After visiting a traditional church, when coming for the second time, a pastor politely and apologetically took me aside and then asked me to leave but wouldn't tell me why. 
A few weeks later, a lady from that church happened to see me in a store. She said that she wouldn't name the family, but that after my first visit to the church, a father, mother, and daughter had had the same dream in one night. In the dream, the Lord asked them if they would invite me into a courtship with their daughter. Most of the time, I would be contacted by the father of the family, but they would just say in so many words that the whole thing was weird, but they thought they'd better talk with me about it. Once I explained my situation, they would be quite surprised, but also decline. With some, I was welcome to remain in fellowship. Uh, with others, I was not welcome to remain in fellowship. Once, I was actually invited into a real courtship, but I was betrothed at the time, so I had had to decline. Also, the Lord had spoken to me audibly long before that and told me who the girl was to marry, a man who'd begun working for her father only a few days before. She later married that man. And actually, I should say, I don't like hear from the Lord every day. It's very rare, but it does happen and has happened through my life. Sorry, I forgot. There was one other occasion where I was invited directly into a courtship. Back when I was working for a group home near Brill, Wisconsin, I was invited to see a special speaker at a church in Rice Lake. That was somewhere in between the event before I was asked to uh, leave a church I had visited and uh, the time of my betrothal. Anyway, while visiting the church to hear the special speaker, I found that a lady that my mom and I had worked with a few seasons at a canning factory was attending there. My mom had also attended this lady's monthly ladies-only Bible meetings as well for a few years. She had asked for prayer for her husband to come to salvation, and there they both were with their family. We would often stay after the service for at least 30 minutes talking about the things of the Lord. Uh, they really liked the spiritual songs that I would receive in dreams once every year or so. After I had attended there two or three months, they happened to mention a prayer request for a daughter in her early 20s who had left her local job and moved to a far city so she could be near her boyfriend. Her boyfriend had been a close personal friend to the church pastor. They had asked for prayer for her because the boyfriend had a history of not treating her well. To expedite the tale, the girl ended up moving home and getting her old job back. The family introduced us the next Sunday. The Sunday after that, she didn't come to church. My anxiety turned to joy as her parents informed me that she had went to check out of her old apartment but would be coming back the next Sunday. Not only that, but she had liked me so much that she had asked her parents if they would ask me if I would be interested in courting her. I was elated. She was a very nice girl and very pretty. As promised, she arrived the next Sunday. She and her family were all smiles. I sat next to her with the family. When the pastor took the podium after the song service, he said, Before I start preaching, I have a word from the Lord. He started and ended his word with, Thus saith the Lord. I can't quote what he said exactly, but I am able to paraphrase it. After scowling at me, he pointed at the girl, called her by name, and told her that unless she wanted to rebel against God, that she would move back to that far city. Not only that, but she would repent to God and her boyfriend for breaking up with him. More than that, she would accept the man's recent request for a marriage. I, the girl, and the family were quite upset. I told the family that it would probably be best for me not to attend there. They promised to let me know whether I would be courting her or if she would marry the pastor's friend. The girl's mother called me a week or two later. The long and the short of it was that the girl and her family finally decided that they would not go against the Lord's anointed one. From that point on, uh, four or five years, uh, no more courtship opportunities occurred. There were two or three girls that I'd pestered the Lord about for way too long until I'd received a very definite and resounding no from him concerning each lady. So yes, the promised betrothal had eventually happened. 
after being asked, I had promised the Lord long before that I would do my best to honor the girl and her family, even if they did not honor me. I had also promised that I would do my best to love them unconditionally, no matter how they treated me. The family had been told at the girl's birth that one day the Lord would ask them to betroth her to a man, and he, the Lord, had promised to confirm the man with many confirmations. At the time, I was part of several home fellowships in a two-hour radius that would occasionally hold a joint meeting. Not too long after I'd entered into the betrothal, many of the fellowships stopped or limited their association with that family and were concerned because I had continued to attend. And, of course, I wasn't allowed to say the reason that I was continuing to attend uh, despite some of the things that were happening, either to me or to others. The evening I had first met the betrothal girl and her family, the girl had had a dream where the Lord had asked her if she would be willing to marry me. She had answered him that she would. To make a long story short, the father had agreed to set up the betrothal and hold it at a local park. Rather than the lady and I entering into a betrothal together, the girl had been dropped off at her sister's house, which was located not too far. From the park. After that, the father had read a letter in front of the family and me at the park about the girl's wish to enter into the betrothal. The rules he had arranged were that we couldn't talk to each other or look at each other. An actual date for the marriage would not be set. Sometime later, we were given the opportunity to rescind our betrothal. Neither of us did. Maybe several months or a year after that, she was asked to quit her job as a restaurant manager and kept home. Not long after that, I'd been told that she had been given the option to meet me the next day with just the clothes she was wearing, leaving her car, belongings, and bank account with her father if she chose to marry me. If she chose to marry me, there would be no contact with her father's family, nor would they accept contact with our children. She had also been informed that she and our children would be written out of the family will. She agreed under duress to rescind the betrothal. Almost immediately, the family moved a few states away. Maybe a year or two after that, the Lord began again to arrange courtship opportunities, just as he'd promised. And with both of these, I actually had a dream and the Lord told me which girls that uh, he was going to choose. And I just had to back off and do nothing and wait and talk to a couple friends of mine, and it was like, yeah, right, that's going to happen. But it did in the space of a few weeks. Anyway, back to uh, the story. Like I've said before, I don't get that excited about it anymore. I know the gig. If he asks, and the girl or the family offers, and that is even rarer now, she will not be interested or someone in her family will dissuade her. I know from experience that the Lord will not allow me to be more than just a very casual acquaintance with a girl if he hasn't arranged for a courtship first. If I step over the boundary, he will separate us. If I am invited into a courtship, that friendship will be just a little less casual, unless we marry. If those limitations are not followed, he just as quickly separates us. And it doesn't take much, nor do I have to be the one who breaks the rule. I still greatly appreciate every Friendship Tower girl I have ever known. I pray almost every day for their blessing and protection and enjoy the rare occasions when I happen to see them or get a letter or email. If they have married, I have wished them well and meant it. The first time was challenging, but after that, with the Lord's help, it was surprisingly easy. I am now old, not very aesthetically appealing, and a pauper. If you have seen the movie The Last American Virgin, that was just a movie. Be that as it may, there is a real American Virgin. I am he. As Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As I have worked on this project, I have realized that it seems as if the Lord will let me be an acquaintance to a lady who knows him, but does not really serve him. Moreover, it seems as if only those ladies who actually have a relationship with him, not someone who merely acknowledges him, or one who is a legalistic religionist, has the potential to enter a courtship phase. 
With the two ladies who were in the tower the longest, I believe they both would have been qualified to enter into the courtship phase. Maybe it was just a matter of free will that kept them from entering the courtship phase, and in the natural they would have had very sound reasons for that decision. Or perhaps it was the Lord himself who weeded them out, so to speak. I don't know. Jesus knows. As far as I know, the friendship tower is now empty. There is one lady that I know who would like to enter the tower, but I think she has knowledge of him, but does not have a relationship with him. There is also another lady who is an acquaintance, but if she is free to enter the, into the tower, most likely she would have no desire to do so. In any event, I am thankful for the positive moments that I have had, both with the Friendship Tower girls and those Christian sisters who I happen to interact with who may never enter that tower. Anyway, enough rambling. Captivated. Like stardust sprinkled across sable skies, she dances along my path. Gossamer wings fluttering softly as baby breath florals with every graceful floating step. Her lovely teeth peek from perfect lips, brighter than the waning moon. I hear her tease me with a voice reminiscent of tinkling brooks and melodious chimes. Captivated by her charms, I find it easy to get lost in sweet dreams, day or night, more beautiful than the purple heather of the grassy fields. I stand amazed. What earthly boon or celestial award that such a fairy princess would even visit me for a protracted moment? I see her beckon. As I approach, the flower of her scent calls to me like a siren's song. But where ancient seafarers need beware, I do not. Instead, I bask in the blessing and feel awed that such a gift has come my way to dance along the path of life and share the adventures that will surely come. Date Unknown Have you seen my love? Have you seen my love? Have you gazed into her eyes? I have read that eyes cannot change color. Not once, but several times, I have observed those magic portals, sometimes as through a fog from a distance, and also from a sweet breath away, when I feel like a man prone on desert sands, soaking in the healing wetness of a cool oasis pool. At times those luscious orbs appear gray like the sea on a gloomy, turbulent day. Other times they are dark blue, flecked with silver like majestic granite mountains at dusk. My favorite color, although I love them all, is when they are bright like glowing turquoise and scintillating sapphires, more dazzling than her mystical smile. It seems that she is happiest then. Whatever the color, green, gold, teal, or sapphire, my love's eyes sparkle like burnished gold and silver. Large, pretty, swallowing the earth and the sea as they scry the world. They are gems that mirror a soul that has traveled through great fires. One in a million, she is more beautiful than Venus on the half-shell. While I am lost in the fantastic dreamscape of those marvelous eyes, I can barely fathom the rest of her bounty. Gifted and possessing a quick mind, kindness and mercy flow from the font of her innermost being. She is a kindred spirit, a lost princess, and the eighth wonder of the world. Date unknown. Again, my name is Wayne O'Connor. I thank you for listening. If you would like to purchase any of these books, Waysides Along the Journey, Baby Echolalia of Christendom, or Visitation, they are available as paperbacks and as ebooks at Amazon.com.